Uh, hello, good afternoon or good evening. Thank you for attending uh, this webinar uh, that uh, will address female uniting continents uh, and uh, will try to highlight what is new to solve a problem that uh, is quite old. My name is Francisco Cruz. I live in Port Portugal. I will moderate this webinar, uh, which will have uh, also as speakers Carl Dietrich Sievert, professor in uh, Detmold in Germany, Professor Finazzi Agro uh, in Rome, Italy, and uh, Professor Lopez Fando in Madrid, Spain. Uh, this uh, webinar is organized by the European School of Urology Online in collaboration uh, with the uh, section, European section of uh, functional and female urology. And uh, 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 if you want to get one European CME credit, you have to complete the questionnaire after attending the webinar. Uh, these are the disclosures of all the four speakers uh, and uh, uh, they will not be shown uh, during our presentations afterwards. This is also the schedule of the, uh, of the uh, presentation today, so I will make a short introduction. Uh, then uh, I will give you highlights about pharmacological treatment uh, which uh, then the, uh, Professor Sievert will talk about sacral neuromodulation and posterior tibial nerve stimulation. Professor Finazzi Agro will talk about uh, what is new in European uh, guidelines for surgical treatment of female stress in our incontinence. And uh, finally, uh, Professor Lopez Fender will talk about artificial urinary sphincter in female stress in our incontinence. Uh, we hope to have at the end about 15 minutes uh, for uh, uh, discussion and for answer your questions. Please send your questions to us. Uh, this is the week uh, of continents in Europe. And so I have a short introduction just to remember uh, uh, all of you uh, that uh, female urinary incontinence is a serious health problem. Uh, uh, in a survey uh, that uh, had uh, as a main question, uh, did you loss, uh, did you have a loss of urine in the last 30 days? 40% of European women respond positively. Uh, and most had stress urinary incontinence less had urgency urinary incontinence and there was a, a group between with mixed urinary incontinence. Uh, we all know that urinary incontinence causes a, a profound decrease in quality of life. Uh, in this study you can see the difference when uh, uh, people have, for example, this is for OAB, have urgency in blue but not incontinence and the decrease in the score, so the decrease in quality of life when uh, incontinence appears. And so the more severe the incontinence, uh, the more the lower is the red lines. Unfortunately, and for cultural reasons, uh, uh, women in Europe uh, don't seek uh, at least quickly uh, medical attention. It is surprising to see that uh, although we had 40%, which is a huge number of women in Europe, only one third of them uh, sought for medical attention, uh, while 50% decided to circumvent the problem going uh, to the supermarket and buying pants, which is wrong. Uh, we have to uh, inform women in Europe that there are effective treatments, including drugs and surgery. Uh, also, uh, I want to highlight that uh, urinary incontinence is extremely expensive to Europe, is probably increasing, and uh, 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 the, the biggest uh, part of the four 
billion of euros that is spent uh, uh, in the, these studies uh, in these countries uh, it, it, it is incredible uh, that because it goes to uh, it, uh, it's a surprise it goes to nursing homes and nursing homes do not treat you in our incontinence just uh, 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 a deposit for persons that have incontinence and change pads every day said that and please tell your colleagues that this is the week for uh, celebrating continence uh, i am going through the pharmacological treatment of uni incontinence and to the question empty pipeline the answer is unfortunately yes it is an empty pipeline uh, of course Pharmacological treatment is oriented for uh, urgency urinary incontinence for OAB, and so it's mostly directed to uh, women, although in elderly men, we also see uh, in the noble study, a uh, 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 low percentage of men that have uh, uh, urgency urinary incontinence. And uh, there is no doubt that the uh, first line treatment should be conservative treatment, but uh, if it fails, pharmacotherapy with antimuscarinic drugs or beta 3 adrenal, uh, adrenal receptor uh, uh, agonists are the key uh, um, drugs for the treatment. Uh, eventually, for postmenopausal women, local estrogens might be used and in uh, some circumstances to decrease urine uh, output we might use desmopressin i am not going to tell you that uh, um, uh, antimuscarinics are moderately effective what i want to tell you and this is i think the most important uh, recent news about antimuscarinics is that uh, exposure uh, uh, to antimuscarinics uh, including those that are used for the treatment of OAB, uh, uh, can induce uh, cognitive dysfunction. This is a meta-analysis published quite recently, and it is quite evident that the longer time for exposure, the higher the risk, and this is particularly evident in elderly patients. So, if you prescribe uh, 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 antimuscarinic drugs for more than three months, check cognitive dysfunctions please uh, we only have in europe one uh, uh, beta 3 agonist is mirabegron is not much more is not more effective uh, than antimuscarinics to reduce micturition frequency and even uh, for dry for 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 decreasing incontinence and for uh, 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 um, uh, putting the or making the patients dry so on the right side is the fully dry rate zero incontinence you can see that uh, they are uh, the uh, mirabegron is quite similar to the the antimuscarinics when used in the normal uh, uh, um, doses of course in high doses uh, antimuscarinics might be slightly more effective, but the side effects are uh, more strong. We know now that uh, Mirabegron is effective in elderly patients, even above the age of 75, to reduce incontinence. And we know that in terms of uh, side effects, uh, in this large uh, database analysis, we can see that uh, uh, whether uh, we uh, look uh, into the patients below the age of 75 or above the age of 75, we see that the most common side effect is for antimuscarinics, dry mouth, and uh, in elderly patients above 75, uh, also constipation. But looking to uh, Mirabegron, we see that there is no difference to uh, placebo, so indicating a very safe drug. Vibegron is already available in the United States, is another uh, beta 3 agonist, uh, and the Empower study uh, showed that uh, uh, during the first 
uh, uh, three weeks, uh, three masses of, uh, uh, of uh, testing uh, against placebo. Uh, Vibegron 75 milligrams is more, is more effective than placebo. In the extension uh, of one year that you can see on the right side, you can see that uh, 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 Vibegron uh, in, in the green line uh, by the uh, the mass six seems uh, slightly more effective than tolteridine in blue uh, to reduce the uh, number of episodes of incontinence. Uh, we don't know uh, if that will be reproduced uh, in uh, real life studies, but uh, we will have V background 75 milligrams in Europe within three months, within one year to two years. An interesting study uh, might be useful for, for us as clinicians to uh, tell the patients what they can expect uh, from the use of beta-3 agonists for uh, uh, mirabegron, uh, the average decrease in micrition episodes will be about 2.5 and uh, the decrease, the average decrease in incontinence will be about 1 uh, per 24 hours. Patients that have more urgency episodes uh, might have higher reduction in micturition episodes but uh, patients that are obese, that have uh, uh, long-term OAB symptoms uh, and that have severe incontinence at baseline will have uh, a, a poor or a smaller uh, effect. Uh, the drugs that uh, act on the uh, sensory uh, arm of the micturition reflex have been investigated, but unfortunately the results are not very good since 2010, they have been investigated uh, with a modulator of substance P and CGRP release, then with NK1 antagonists, and quite recently with uh, uh, a P2X3 antagonist to prevent the activation of sensory fibers by ATP. Elia Pixent was investigated in a trial, uh, a placebo controlled trial, but it failed. And so, uh, in, in conclusion, OAB pharmacotherapy remains limited to antimuscarinics and beta-3. We have to keep in mind, and that is the most important new uh, uh, in 2023, is that prolonged antimuscarinic medication, particularly in high doses and in elderly patients, might increase the risk of cognitive dysfunctions, that we don't have drugs acting on the sensory arm and uh, I think uh, uh, research is needed in order to identify drugs acting on the sensory arm because we already have drugs acting on uh, the uh, uh, efferent on the motor arm that is uh, antimuscarinics and beta-3. Thank you for your attention. Uh, I am going to close now the my presentation and and over to uh, um, Carl Dietrich Siebert. Please, Carl. Is it the one? It's fine, fine, Carl. Okay, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Francesco. And one of the questions definitely is, what is sacral modulation or the second one, which is picking up quite with some speed, the posterior tibial nerve stimulation doing in our situation. So if we are looking into the guidelines, I think you all know that the bladder wall injection of more or less what we call Botox today is usually done in those patients with a non-neurogenic situation with 100 units. And the question is how those patients are doing. The continu discontinuation rate is quite high, which probably is related to the situation to come back to the office and get the injections between six to 12 months, however, and how long it lasts. So the other situation usually is the infection rate, whereas sacral nerve modulation is the stage implant, and you can test how it works, 
which I think is a very important aspect to it. And all the verification in comparison to Botox has been with the 200, and I will come back to that in a moment. Quite new is the post nerve stimulation. It seems to be more effective than the antimuscarinics, which we just have heard from Francesco. And I think that is majorly related that we do not have the side effects. However, if it is performed transcutaneous or percutaneously, it seems to be very similar. Coming back to the situation of the comparison between Botox and the situation of SNM, as you can see here, the Hulzetta study, which have been published quite a while ago, demonstrates quite nicely from the aspect of the urge incontinence episodes that of, of course the Botox is more efficient, but you have to realize that in this study it was used with 200 units and not with a 100 unit situation. So there is this long term study which demonstrated a better effect and of course with that a dryness situation. And the patients have to be willing to undergo self catheterization if there is a need and I think that is an important criteria already how you choose your patients. Just recently published is the question, what is better in the economy side? And therefore, I think we have to all realize how we look at it. If we look at it from the two year data, which has been published in the Rosetta study, and then estimated for the another five years, of course, the botulinum toxin A seems to be calculated cheaper than with the SNM. The other group coming from the Spanish side, already published quite a while ago, demonstrated that if looked for 10 years, it is the situation that SNM seems to be predominant compared to the botulinum toxin A situation, which was confirmed recently, beside the side effects, from a urology publication, which shows that there is a better outcome if you look beyond five years. So we have to keep in mind who is looking from which time frame? What is new in the technology? You might have heard about that already. We have for quite a while the Interstim 2, but a few years back, Axionics started to approach the market with a very small rechargeable implant. Therefore, Medtronic has to react and came up with the Micron, which is rechargeable. And now recently they came up with the Interstim X, which is not rechargeable, same size, but lasting longer, about 15 years. What is the advantage of rechargeable? We all thought probably patients who need higher energy and might be wheelchair bounded patients are beneficial from those smaller implants. For the Medtronic implant, I think a downside is you need to use two different electrodes. And if you want to switch between the interstem and then the micro and the X, you have an electrode problem. And as you can see on this picture, Axionix has also one with a battery, which is an IPG non-rechargeable. But interesting is that if we look on recent data from different publications, and especially from Medtronic themselves, that probably still more than 90% are recharge free, so battery implants and not the rechargeable. If I talk to my patients, I think it is related. You have to take extra package with you to charge it in a decent time again. Is there a benefit? A quality of life seems to be beneficial if we look on the minimal important differences of 10 points. As you can see, coping, sleeping and social and of course, a quality of life has been increased over the time after three months. And if you see this for the OAB, urinary incontinence and the frequency, the benefit is there depending how you put your measurements. We already heard about the cognitive situation. I think it is important because we have more elderly and we have to think about is such a treatment option one for those patients. And as the Goldman Group has demonstrated, we should not exclude those from the sacral nerve modulation, at least in this paper published. The sound study in, from France demonstrated us that there is, over the five years, a good outcome for these patients. 
What I want to point out, the surgical revisions with 39% seems to be quite high. If you look into other publications, it's around 8 to 10%. But 15% of these eggplants have been related to the situation because they have not MRI B compatible, which we have now for the new implants with the electrodes. Another new aspect is, which might approach into our testing phase, is that the group around Limin from China demonstrated that we can see different aspects in the brain reflected in the BRCA9 area already for the sacral nerve modulation and now recently very similar data for the tibial nerve stimulation. So we have quite some evidence that it is not only working on the level of the spine to the bladder, but also responding in, if working in the brain. Everybody is talking about MIST, minimal invasive surgical techniques. So it is no wonder that people are looking in what might be the ones which are picked up by our patients. Compared botulinum toxin, sacral nerve modulation or tibial nerve stimulation, demonstrated that those with PTNS have quite a rapid uptake during the last two years, wherever Botox and sacral nerve modulation are slightly increasing as they have done over the years. So we have to think about for our patients that they might want us to offer this to them. There are some implants coming, not only office depending, patients want to become independent. So we have different implants, probably the, um, the coin one is the one which has been demonstrated the most recently and it can be shown in this single arm trial that there is the effect we might look for. It is not as dominant as we would have expected in the United States now after the study, but I think we will see this and other implants to come for the tibial nerve stimulation. The troop study or the troop trial compared PTNS with the um, situation of onabotulinum toxin. And you all see in the top part that the detrusor overactivity was higher with 60% in the group of the Botox patients. And otherwise, after three months, it seems that the cure rate were quite similar between those two. Before I told you that it is variable and comparable to the drug situation, the oral drugs. But here we have the first evidence that it might be also very similar to the situation with Botox. And of course, again, the Botox will improve better the urgency and of course the urgency um, urge incontinence episode because of fatiguing the detrusor muscle. If we look into this, and this is a new comparison of the different types, and it might be a little bit irritating, but in conclusion, when we are looking to the different ways to use this, it is said that the orange line is the sacral nerve modulation, and the other one, the violet one, is the botulinum toxin A, and black, the PTNS. It is quite surprising that the SMM ranked first in the micturition and frequency, the urgency episode, and urge urinary incontinence episode. So we have to look into the data, what is the outcome of the patient. In conclusion, if we are looking into those situations when all studies are analyzed, and we try to compare sacral nerve modulation with PTNS or transcutaneous, it seems that the sacral nerve modulation is related to the quality of life, urgency episodes and urinary frequency, whereas the TPNS or the TTNS is reducing the urge incontinence episodes related to that, the number of pads respectively. But if we are talking to our patients, we have to keep in mind how we see it and what we are telling our patients. Here is a short overview from Thomas Kessler, who used that to compare them. The efficacy seems to be the same. Adverse events, we all know, seems to be more likely for the botulinum toxin. But in the long term, and I pointed that out with quite some diff, uh, publications, above five years implantation, the benefit is there for the botulinum toxin. Whereas the preference seemed to be also for this situation of sacral nerve modulation. 
Just as an example, if you are taking publications, how our patients are informed. And if you look at this from Hashim Hashim and the book writer, they are specific authors who have their major focus. And as you can see, the one or the other is affecting the patient with their preference. So I ask you to keep that in mind when and how you will inform your patients about the next possible step in treating OAB. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Kitty. Excellent presentation. Uh, Enrico, be ready. Yes, I'm ready. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Francisco. <clears throat> and so this is uh, um, my time. I would like to say hello to everybody who is listening to us. Um, my talk will be about the EAU guidelines uh, and uh, especially uh, specifically on uh, what's new on the surgical treatment for female stress uh, urinary incontinence. Uh, I hope it's working. Yes, you know, as you know, the guidelines are updated regularly. Basically, they are updated every year. So I will I will try to put uh, in this uh, presentation was what is uh, particularly new. Uh, so new from the 2023 guidelines or something new in the 2022 uh, guidelines. Um, I will uh, talk about uh, what's new, as I was saying. I will uh, summarize uh, the new things uh, in a slide like that with the here, here, uh, on the, uh, the bottom of the slide, uh, and the summary of evidence recommendations uh, um, in, uh, in this uh, table. Um, I would like to start with, with this. Uh, actually, the guidelines have been uh, influenced in the last uh, uh, few years uh, very much on the, by the debate that started in the UK, uh, especially in the UK, uh, on the risk, on the problems related to the uh, synthetic uh, slings, synthetic meshes, in general, and also synthetic uh, slings for, uh, uh, sorry, for uh, stress urinary incontinence. And so I think th this is uh, probably the first uh, new recommendation that uh, comes in these new guidelines, uh, that is employ a shared decision-making approach when deciding on appropriate treatment for stress uh, urinary incontinence. So this was discussed, you see, with the, also the patient representatives uh, uh, that are also uh, contributing to the to the guidelines, and I think this is a, a very sensible suggestion that we have to share our uh, decision making uh, uh, approach uh, with uh, with uh, with the patient and to try understand her uh, um, ex expectations, her uh, um, uh, thoughts before deciding the the, the strategy. Um, but also the, the, the guidelines also have to uh, collect data of the, on the literature and uh, basically what we can see, this, is a, uh, this comes from the joint statement of the um, AUA and SUFU uh, and AUGS society from the US. But uh, uh, you, you see that we can agree that no other surgical treatment for sensory incontinence mm, uh, has been uh, investigated uh, as uh, the midurethral slings, because uh, we have uh, really a lot of, of data on, on this uh, treatment. Also, with the long-term data, you see here in these uh, slides, we have 17 years uh, uh, follow-up, uh, basically 17 years uh, is a very long uh, follow-up. If you are operated at 50, uh, you are 77 uh, after 70 years, and I mean you are probably not the same the same person you you were when you got the the, the operation. Uh, also, the Chenier, the committee uh, that was uh, uh, created in in Europe about the safety of surgical mesh, agrees that uh, the, the, the 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 data are, for slings are very uh, are good, or at least are present, uh, even in the long term. And this is also the position of the CNUG uh, uh, Society, the uh, Ibero-American Society for uh, Neurology and Neurogynecology. And uh, 
Uh, another thing that we should uh, consider is that uh, we, if we look to the literature, the, the midriters links uh, have uh, in the literature less pain, a shorter hospitalization, a faster return to usual uh, uh, activities and a reduced cost as compared with uh, uh, historical or previous options uh, uh, that we were used before uh, the, the links. Uh, so is, the, is there uh, something better? Uh, basically, uh, if we look to this uh, um, systematic review by Fernando Fusco and co-workers, uh, the links seem, seem to have uh, either better results, for instance, in comparison to uh, birch corpus suspension, or less uh, complications, for instance, uh, versus the pubovaginal uh, slings. And this is also something that we should consider. But at the end, this is what our guidelines suggest. So to offer a mid ureter slings uh, to women seeking surgical treatment for stress urinary incontinence, but following a through discussion of the risk and benefits uh, relative to other surgical modalities. So we have to inform always patients about uh, the good aspects of uh, the, the slings and or the of the other possible surgical treatments before uh, to, to decide uh, the operation. What we also the guidelines say is that uh, the long-term outcomes of the retropubic route seems to seems super superior to the transuturator route outcomes. And uh, we also have to discuss uh, about the complication that uh, may be associated to these uh, um, procedures and discuss all the alternatives. But of course, we have to consider the complication of this surgery, surgical treatment, but also the complication of other uh, possible treatment. What the Chenier recommends is that the link should be used by an experienced and appropriately trained surgeon. I think this is very sensible. So links uh, seem to be a very easy procedure to do, but if it is done by someone who is not experienced enough, not uh, trained enough, uh, then uh, the results may be uh, really bad. Uh, and uh, I mean, of course, uh, patients uh, could have uh, uh, afterward uh, severe, even severe complications. So uh, if we approach this treatment, we have to be experienced and appropriately trained. What is uh, uh, new in these uh, here guidelines uh, is uh, some some uh, are some results about uh, uh, the mini the so-called mini slings single incision slings uh, particularly for the adjust and the altis uh, mini slings uh, this uh, randomized trial was published in uh, 2022 by Abdel Fattah and co-workers and uh, if we go to the next slide uh, you see here uh, the recommendation coming from this uh, paper and uh, that are now in the guidelines is that uh, we can inform women, uh, women who are being offered uh, a single incision slings, uh, they're just an altis, that short term, short term efficacy appears equivalent compared to conventional mid ureter slings. So we have data now to, to say that a three year follow up, uh, the results uh, of these mini slings are uh, similar or comparable to uh, traditional slings. On the other hand, we also we have also this evidence that the rate of mesh exposure, the re repeat uh, surgery or dyspareunia atria is higher for these mini slings in comparison to um, traditional slings. And also in the guidelines here, we have also this re this uh, uh, let's say recommendation that we have to inform the patients undergoing this procedure that long-term efficacy remains uncertain. So this is the uh, actual uh, situation about uh, mini slings uh, that is in our new guidelines. These are recommendations about other uh, surgical treatments, basically nothing particularly new in these guidelines, but you see that for instance, bulking agents, uh, uh, are uh, considered a low risk procedure, but on the other uh, end, the efficacy seems lower than other surgical procedure. The repeat injections are likely to ne be needed and long-term durability and safety are not established. This is uh, uh, for, for the, the bulking agents. The autologous link may be 
uh, also suggested, again, uh, following a through discussion about risk and benefits, and also the culpa suspension, that is probably the more, more traditional uh, surgical uh, procedure can be also proposed. What I wanted to uh, also show you is the, this slide about uh, um, taken from a paper uh, uh, done in, uh, in Scotland, does in the UK. And you see here that uh, the number of procedure uh, was, incre was uh, uh, increasing, was higher year after year, starting from the 2000 until let's say, 2015, because here you see you have uh, in this line uh, the, the the mesh are not specified here. These two new lines are uh, retropubic and transubtubular mesh separated. Uh, but so, so the, the 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 use of these meshes was going uh, up and up. It was, was higher and higher year by year. Then it went down after these uh, problems in the UK. But what, what you don't see is an increase of other treatments. So you see going down these lines, but you don't see other treatments coming up. So what uh, seems, what is, what, what this slide seems to suggest is that uh, basically there was a decrease of surgical treatment. Let's uh, uh, say what this thing is without uh, an increase of other treatment. So probably some patients are, uh, were not. Uh, uh, treated in the last years, at least uh, until uh, 2015 or 16 in, in UK. This is a danger of uh, a huge discussion of the, on, on this uh, uh, treatment, but without uh, a new treatment to be proposed in alternative. Um, this is, uh, these are the recommendations about uh, the um, simultaneous surgery for prolapse and stress renal incontinence. And basically, you have uh, to discuss benefits and potential risks that are higher. Of course, the risk of a combined treatment in comparison to uh, a treatment only for prolapse. So we have to decide case by case, but uh, uh, let's say this, the, the guidelines do not suggest to uh, do a simultaneous uh, treatment of prolapse and surgery uh, on a regular basis. And these are the recommendations for the uh, recurrent uh, stress urinary incontinence. Uh, you see that adjustable midurethral slings can be considered uh, uh, a, a good uh, a good option in in this uh, category of patients. But also we have to consider that all the other treatments can be proposed, but the results are uh, uh, let's say less uh, less good. Uh, then uh, if these uh, treatments are proposed for uh, the first line. But you see, there, there is everything else in this slide uh, com in comprising also the, the artificial uh, sphincter uh, as uh, to treat the recurrent stress uh, incontinence. And uh, finally, I think this, this is my last slide. The, in, this is a recommendation from the last year, 2022. Uh, that is, uh, th there are several limitations about uh, the, the evidence in literature about uh, vaginal laser treatment for stress urinary incontinence, uh, and the recommendation of the um, of the guidelines of the EU is that to not do not offer vaginal laser therapy to treat uh, uh, stress urinary incontinence outside of a well-regulated clinical research trial. So only in a research trial we are allowed to offer this treatment that is not considered yet, uh, uh, let's say, normal clinical uh, uh, practice. And uh, with this slide, uh, no, I, I have just to add, uh, this, this, is, this was my last slide actually about treatment, but I just want to make a comment uh, more on uh, uh, preoperative evaluation. You see there is something new about uh, in, the, in the guidelines about uh, uh, urodynamic investigation. You see that preoperative urodynamic test uh, is uh, suggested when stress urinary incontinence is associated with storage symptoms, in cases in which the type of incontinence is unclear, in cases in which voiding dysfunction is suspected, and cases with associated pelvic organ prolapse or prior surgery for stress urinary incontinence. So this, in all these cases, uh, um, urodynamic investigation seem to be 
considered, uh, at least this is what the position of the guidelines, I think, I think this is very sensible because if we, if we want to have a, a better counseling to our patients and if we want to have more informations before to operate on our patients, uh, the invasive urodynamic uh, uh, investigation should be considered in all these complicated uh, patients, you see. And this, is, this was my last slide and I thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, uh, Enrico. And now the news from Madrid. Uh, uh, so let's uh, listen to Luis Lopez friend. Luis, please. I'm, what a, I don't know what's the problem with my presentation. Okay, right now. I, I would like to say that prefectory stress urinary incontinent and stress urinary incontinent is an old problem. We have a lot of data, a lot of demographic data that we already know, and we have different uh, treatment options for, for stress urinary incontinence. An artificial urinary sphincter is not really new. It's not a new topic, but now we have different approach that make an, now a really interesting uh, device to treat refractory stress urinary incontinence. We have this device since 1980s, and we have controversials about how to use artificial urinary skin. Probably is it's a, and we, we think in artificial urinary skin only for pure ISD, but there are some patients with intrinsic sphincter deficiency that we think to use, and we can use artificial urinary skin there. So artificial urinary skin there is a fashion, is new. We try to say about what the, the real problem. Since some years ago in France, we know that the longest follow-up of women treated with artificial urinary skin there implantation is safety, feasibility, and effectiveness in these patients. And we can give our women a good quality of life. So what's the what is do what is happening in France and now what is happening in our other countries? What well, the total number of artificial urinary splinter implants are really increasing in France since 2014. So they think that they, they is increasing with the safety approach of the robotic approach. Meanwhile, male artificial urine surgeries in this time are similar, probably with improving also with the robotic approach of radical prostatectomy. But what we know about artificial urinary sphincter, we have evidence about that. We have some systematic review. I can show you this, and we have 36 year experience. Most of the study are in France about artificial urinary sphincter in women. We have good results also with open surgery with a low, not too much explantation free, uh, explantation rate. And also the revision rate is close to 70, close to less than 30% of patients. So we, we saw the survival rate of the of the artificial urinary sphincter in women, we know that in 10 years we have 69% of the device survival at 10 years. And also we know that the device survival is better six months after the six months after implantation. So comparison between men and women, probably in women the device is going to survive longer, probably because we introduced it in the bladder neck, not in the ureter. So what's the evidence, what the, what the, the guidelines say us about artificial urinary sphincters? We have evidence also in the, in, in the IC guide about the, what's the role of artificial urinary sphincter probably for recurrent stress urinary incontinence and for intrinsic deficiency uh, incontinence. But also in the European guidelines, we know that implantation can improve and cure incontinence with uncomplicated stress urinary incontinence. And also 
for complicated stress urinary incontinence. But we have to know that in women with previous purge, colposuspension, or previous radiotherapy, explantation rate is really high. But we have to know this, but it's not uh, a contraindication for this implantation. So why the gold standard for men is not the gold standard for women? What is the difference between France and the rest of the world? The difference is that in the guidelines, in the French guidelines, the artificial urinary continence is the gold standard if in case of lack of urethral mobility, but not in the rest of the world that we, it's, it's another treatment. Why is that? Probably because we think that we have not enough data, but we have 36 years of data. We think that we have non-clear indication, but we have a clear indication. Probably there is controversy with surgical route. We are going to talk about laparoscopic and robotic because it's safety than, uh, uh, than open surgery. And we are afraid about complications. We are afraid about medical, me mechanical failure. And we are also afraid about long-term results. But we have shown that we have data enough to say that we have good results and long-term results. So the problem is safety. In this series, we have, we have shown that 20% of patients, so one each five patients, have problem with bladder neck disasions. We have problem with bladder perforation or vaginal injury, probably in open surgery. But also in some, when you do an anterior approach, you have a non-really anatomical plane. We can find this anatomical plane with the robot, but not with open or laparoscopic if you go for an anterior approach. So we need to find an, an anatomical plane, and we think that basic vaginal space, that it can be done, it can be performed laparoscopic or robotic, is the best approach for laparoscopic artificial urinary sphincter. So we are going to talk all, only for laparoscopic. I'm going to show you the videos, but we can perform this surgery similar with robotic. So we are going to try to describe in some slides the difference with the classical approach, the anterior approach, and the basic vaginal approach, the posterior approach, and how to perform it with laparoscopic, it's the same technique with uh, robotic, which use uh, the first step is to open the cicopaginal space. We can, per, we can open it and the dissection is similar when we perform sacrocolpopexy. And then we are going to open two windows in the lateral vesical space. This is the right one, and we can see how we open the left lateral vesical space. So in this moment, we have the pubis, we have the vesicovaginal space, and we have both lateral vesical space, and we, are, we have to connect vesicovaginal space to lateral vesical space. We always perform it from inside to outside, because when you do with laparoscopic, you don't have your, your arms, you don't have, you only have straight arms, so you have to perform it from inside to outside, this is the right one, and this is the left one. You, it's not a blind technique, you are control all the dissection from inside to outside. We introduce the capsizer, we introduce from outside to inside to the basic vaginal space and from inside to outside, and then we dissect the, the, the anterior bladder neck and we try to perform the pubovesical uh, pubo uh, pubo ligament. We, have, we always perform in this moment flexible cystoscopy to control where is the, the device and where we are going to introduce the device. And then it's similar that we, as we can do, and we saw 36 degree of our calf introducing in the, the connections and all everything since right now, it's similar uh, to, to, to the implantation in MEM. We 
are going to straight out to the inguinal right uh, inguinal right open that we have done uh, to their left and, and we always go to the right to the labia majori to the labia majori you can choose the right or the left one we always try to to choose the the right one and we have no no problem you can check the activation if you perform laparoscopic, although the most of the cases we don't do, and in these cases we also do uh, flexible cystoscopy to control all the movement, and you can control the 30, 60 degree of the laparoscopic uh, approach. The last thing you have to do is to close peritoneum, and it is the final surgery. So we perform with this laparoscopic approach 25 cases, this is the similar like other series with most of the patients with previous surgery. These are severe patients with a long past test. And in our series, 60% of the patients are with hypocontractility. We only have one bladder injury, but we do develop because the bladder in injury was not in the bladder neck. The cap sizes are from 6.5 to 8 centimeters. We leave the catheter during five days and we have very good safety, low complications and no device removal since 2080. We have to wait from the last, uh, I, I think, for the next Congress, for the next European Urology Congress for, to have results from this Venus study, and we can conclude that laparoscopic, also the robotic, provides a magnificent view, which prefer, which allow us to have a better dissection of the urethrovaginal uh, space and the bladder neck. And the vesicovaginal space dissection, similar to sacrocolpopexy, allows a non-blind implantation of the cap around the dorsal side of the bladder neck. So thank you very much for your attention, and I leave Francisco to introduce the debate. Thank you very much, uh, Luis. It was a, an excellent presentation from uh, all of you. Uh, and uh, I have several questions that I have collected during your presentations. And uh, well, because uh, Luis, you are still there, uh, how do you define, that is one of the questions, how the clinician defines the patients that are uh, 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 the ideal candidates for artificial urinary sphincter? The French guidelines uh, just say uh, 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 no urethral uh, mobility. Is that a good criteria? Should we, or better criteria? I think it's not enough criteria because you have, it depends. You, I think you have to have moderate or severe, severe stress urinary incontinence with a long path test because if you have a lack, if you have a, a not movement urethra but a really low uh, stress urinary incontinence, you can use bulking agents. I think it's for refractory stress urinary incontinence. And also, I think it's the better option for this kind of patient with hypocontractility. Uh, and also for patients with problems with mesh. Mm -hmm. Problem with mesh, this is uh, another alternative. So you, I think there is no only uh, one criteria. You have to use different criteria and to select very good the patients. Uh, well, uh, Luis, uh, one question that could come only from Netherlands. Jessica van Dijk is asking if uh, uh, women can ride the bike after uh, putting uh, an artificial urinary sphincter. I think for sure you can ride the bike without problem because you have uh, the, the, the calf is in the bladder neck and you are not able to to have pro you are not going to have any problem with with the with the cup. So Jessica, you have the the answer. Uh, uh, Enrico, 
Joseph Marenk, I, I, I hope I'm saying the, the name correctly, was uh, asking, well, in the end, uh, single decision slings have a future. Uh, well, do you agree? Yeah, I, I tried also already to, to answer uh, directly to, to him uh, in writing. Uh, well, uh, actually, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I cannot foresee the future, but uh, uh, I, I mean, what we know now is that uh, um, we had, I mean, uh, let's say uh, the first uh, mi mini slings that were not going so well. So now we have new ones. Uh, probably these ones are better designed. They have uh, uh, better uh, systems uh, um, of placement and uh, to be uh, anchored to the um to the pelvis uh, so they, they work better than than before this is something that we we can say now uh we have doubt now this data on uh, about three years follow-up uh, and they seem uh, to work uh, uh well uh, actually I, I cannot foresee the future uh, as i told you in at this moment my personal opinion but this is my just my personal opinion is that in my clinical practice i use much more the uh, the traditional slings actually than than mini slings, but we will see in the future about these new systems. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we reviewed our, our data with ten years follow up, and the results are quite acceptable. So, uh, so it, it, uh, it, it is possible that we they will be they will have a future. I mean. Uh, one guy is asking about uh, 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 not bulkamiv, but about urolon. Do you have any information about that? Not really. Not really. Okay. Uh, Carl, uh, Kitty, uh, uh, what, I think probably you already answered the question because it is a pure, uh, but about the doses of botulinum toxin uh, at the moment uh, of... Um, uh, uh, yeah. I think there are two answers to this. If we go to the like, guidelines, for the non-neurogenic situation, it is 100 units of botulinum toxin A, owner botulinum toxin. If you are switching to another company, you have to look into the lines, but it is approved now in many countries in Europe. But on the other side, if it is not effective, we see more and more colleagues to use instead of the 100, also the 200 in the long term. So the recommendation is definitely to start with 100, and see what the effect and how long it's lasting. And then if needed, I would suggest to wait at least four months that you don't have the situation more be to an allergic situation. We do not know, but wait a certain time until you do a second additional injection to it. Uh, uh, if a patient comes to you and I, I, I enjoyed very much your slide showing that the uh, surgic, the, uh, the 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 um, uh, surgery uh, preferences uh, influences the patients. But let's admit that, like you, you are not uh, the surgeons don't influence the patient. Uh, what do you think? It is the best first option that uh, for for a patient with the uh, uh, urgent urinary incontinence not 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 controlled by oral therapy should we, we go immediately to second neuromodulation or should we go f uh, still for a period of botox uh, and uh, have uh, let's say a delay in terms of, uh, of uh, in the implantation of sac uh, sacral neuromodulation i think it is Definitely what you have to find out in the conversation with your patient. Preference, some patients do not want to deal with the technology of a sacral nerve modulation, an implant, as we have the classical ones. Others are afraid of the situation of coming back for injections. I try to take it from that point that if the patient decides for botulinum toxin, and if it doesn't work, we cannot immediately switch over to sacral nerve modulation evaluation, like a PE test. But we can go for the evaluation with a PE test. And if it doesn't work for this patient, we still can go very quickly and switch over to this, the 
botulinum toxin treatment. And I think that is an option which should be discussed. How much time you have to have between the first Botox and then the initial testing phase of the sacral nerve modulation or another technique like tibial, but that you do not have like an overlapping effect of the botulinum toxin with additional treatment if it is post -tib uh, tibial nerve stimulation or sacral nerve modulation. So that is the only thing which I try to advise the patient, but otherwise I try to find out what kind of type the patient is and what they want to go with. If you have somebody who wants a much faster track, probably the botulinum toxin is what they want to start with because they come usually, and you pointed it out, it takes quite a while before a patient is coming to consult you for their issue. And therefore, some of them are quite frustrated over the years and they want really something happening immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the acceptance of uh, the implantation of PTNS devices uh, in Germany? It's quite small still. Quite small still. Okay, uh, and uh, I have uh, two questions uh, that were directed uh, to me. Uh, one was from Joseph. Uh, if there are drugs that are under development for uh, stress urinary incontinence, unfortunately, no. Uh, there was a small trial with a, a, a drug similar to duloxetine, but uh, it failed. So nursing. There are no drugs for stress urinary incontinence, and I'm sure that drugs do not reposition the bladder and the urethra in the right position. So I don't believe on uh, drugs for stress urinary incontinence. Uh, about uh, the uh, the uh, cognition uh, cognitive effects of antimuscarinic drugs. Uh, probably uh, this is not uh, well of particular concern uh, uh, in young patients that are not uh, under long-term treatment. But for elderly patients, I think we have to be very careful, and we have to inform the patient and the relatives that the 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 the, uh, the patient. Uh, mood might change, the memory might decrease. Uh, the, does it, the changes, the cognitive changes go back to the original level? Uh, if you stop the antimuscarinic drug, most probably yes. Uh, if it is for uh, the administration, the exposure is for a small period of time. But if it is for a long period of time, most probably some uh, uh, lesions will remain forever because there is evidence of brain atrophy uh, uh, that uh, uh, appears in some studies. And don't forget that the uh, anticholinergic effect uh, uh, is cumulative, which means that all the drugs that have uh, antimuscarinic effect will uh, add uh, to the total effect. I don't know if we have more questions. Uh, I don't think so. Our time uh, is finished. Uh, and so uh, I just have to uh, thank you all uh, uh, our colleagues that were with us uh, during the last hour uh, to thank uh, uh, Luis uh, for your nice surgeries. Thank you, Kitty, for your very non-biased presentation, which is important uh, to highlight uh, uh, our colleagues. Uh, thank you, Enrico, for highlighting uh, the uh, news in terms of surgery that uh, appear now in the guidelines of uh, this year of 2023. And uh, 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 ju just as a final, final word, don't forget to inform our colleagues in your hospitals that this is the continuous week thank you very much for being with us during the last uh, hour and enjoy the rest of the afternoon thank you very much thank you and goodbye bye thanks for a great meeting bye thank you